morning, everybody. You're looking good today. You know it's uh, you know it's Palm Sunday today. The triumphal entry when Jesus went into Jerusalem. We're going to look at that because that means we're only a week out from Resurrection Sunday. So this whole next week, especially uh, today, Wednesday, with our upper room service. Uh, that's kind of focused, very specifically focused on what happened to Jesus on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And of course, we all come back to celebrate next Sunday. Wouldn't it be great if we could just skip to next Sunday and like, whoa, let's just talk about the resurrection. But you see, you can't appreciate the resurrection until you know the suffering, the death actually started on the triumphal entry. You say, well, that was just like a parade. Oh, no, it wasn't just a parade. It was the greatest parade in the history of mankind because you have Jesus showing up openly, publicly of, as king of Israel. Up until that triumphal entry, he told everybody to keep it quiet. Don't spread it. I don't want to announce. But when it was the day, the day for him to show up, I mean, right down to what Daniel prophesied, it's not just a day. No, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It was that day when he showed up in Jerusalem as king of Israel. I'm king. But what you have to factor in, he doesn't look like a king. He's not acting like a king. Because we always think of kings as like, you know, there they come with their soldiers. There they come with their trumpets. There they come with their people. And Jesus came with a bunch of ragamuffins. It is the greatest parade. I was in a parade one time. Well, several times. I was in the band in high school and stuff. But my, my greatest that I have memory of, I actually got to play at Mile High Stadium with the Denver Broncos. I was not playing football. I was playing a trumpet. Uh, let me correct that. I, I was making noise with my trumpet. I never was able to play the trumpet, but I could make noise with it. And maybe you've been to parades or you have these other things that you kind of remember. But I'm telling you, the greatest one of all time, of all time, you have God in the flesh presenting himself for who he is. I'm king of Israel. Now, we already know they're going to reject him. We know that. But I, I need you to see the context of that. So turn, turn to Luke chapter 19. Get your Bibles. Turn to Luke chapter 19, verse 28. That's on page 1288. If you're not familiar, it's on page 1288 of a seat back. Seat back. <laughs> Come on, Bill. Uh, Bible. Luke chapter 19, verse 28. So I want you to be there. We're going to be there in a moment. But I want to remind you what Jesus already told the boys before they got there. He, he did not want his disciples to not know what's really going on. So for the third time, for the third time, before he gets there, he stops and he tells them exactly what's going to happen. He knows what's going to happen, starting with the triumphal entry. So my brother read it for me with a vest that won't button up. That's it. That's not in my, my notes. I didn't make it up. He opened the door. So I'm just following through. So. so I want to remind you what he just read. So look at the screen. Pay attention. This is before he gets to Jerusalem. This is before the triumphal entry. Now, Jesus going up to Jerusalem. He did that every year, three times a year. That's not unusual. This is the last time before. The, this is Passover. Now, Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples aside on the road, and he said to them, behold, behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes. So Jesus dropping on the disciples, like I said, this is the third time. You guys need to know what's really going on. We're going up. They're going to act like everything's fine. It's not fine. The Son of Man, this week, this week, I'm going to be betrayed to the scribes and Pharisees. Those are the leaders. Those would be the politicians. They're the rulers of the country. I'm going to be, and they already want to kill him. He said, it's going to happen this week. I'm going to be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes. And they will condemn him to death. The Son of Man, I'm going to be condemned to death. 
And then they, the leadership of Israel, is going to deliver the Christ, me, the Son of God. They're going to deliver him to the Gentiles, to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day, he will rise again. Now, see, we already live. We know that that's actually true, the resurrection. But if you're a disciple here, like, hey, no, we're, we're going to go take over, right? No, we're not taking over anything. No, no, no. I mean, it's Passover. We've been waiting for the Messiah, for the Christ. I mean, these crowds of people, they're all excited. Excited about what? That God finally, like he did in Egypt and Pharaoh, we were in bondage. He sent a deliverer, Moses. And now somebody greater, the Christ, the king has come. But here's what they thought. You need to deliver us. Whoever this is, they're waiting, waiting for centuries. They've been waiting and waiting. Waiting for what? For, for the politician Jesus. We, we need a king that'll come and take care of Caesar and take care of Rome and take care of the soldiers and take care of the taxes and the occupation. We need to be delivered just the way Israel and Egypt was. And see what they don't understand. You, you've got to put these things in order because you have a bigger problem than government. You have a bigger problem than your job. You have a bigger problem than your taxes. Your big problem is your sin. No, I, you just need to get rid of the soldiers. No, I'm going to get rid of your sin. Because the real big problem you have is the grave. Death is coming. Well, I thought it was with taxes. Well, then your bigger problem after that is hell. So when we talk about Jesus in his triumphal entry, you need to know all the ones cheering, and they should be cheering, but they're hoping for a conquering, get us out of Rome, get Rome out of us, and somehow we'll be free. Right. No, I came to pay the price for your sins. Amen. And then you can be free. It got quiet in the room. Do you know why I got, you're just like first service. You're doing the math. Well, I just want Jesus to fix this. this. He fixed your biggest problem, sin. Amen. If you know Jesus, you're going to heaven. Amen. Translated, your problem solved. Amen. Did you know that? You know Jesus, right? Do you know Jesus? You're going to heaven. So what's your problem? Hey, pastor, I still got all this stuff going on. Well, I get that. But I'm just saying, the biggest problem solved. And that's why we're going to celebrate next week. And as a matter of fact, we were left here. So all these other people that we know in our country, in our city, around the world, they don't have a clue about that. They still think their biggest problem isn't their biggest problem. You guys are looking just like first service. You say, no, that's why you have to understand the triumphal entry. It is a triumphal entry, but he's sharing with his disciples about his death and his resurrection. And just so you know, technically, technically, he's already a wanted man. They've already made the decision before he even gets up there. Can I see the quote, uh, the verse out of John 11? John 11. Now, both the chief priests and the Pharisees, they run the country. The chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command. It's an order that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. That's before he even gets there. You say, what's going on? He's a wanted man. And now he'll manifest who he truly is on a triumphal entry. And he knows exactly where that's going, to a cross. And he'll boldly do that. We'll see his emotions on this triumphal entry. We'll see that actually on this Sunday, the preparation for resurrection next Sunday cost him everything emotionally, mentally. I might even say psychologically. You think it was easy? You think it was like all of a sudden I'm on the donkey and everything's fixed? Mm -mm. It's the beginning of suffering so that we might be saved. If you're a visitor, you're thinking, is that the sermon? That's just the introduction. <laughs> we got, but we're going to move this pretty quick, and uh, you'll see. You'll see. What a Savior 
conquering king we have in Jesus. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you that we can come to you and thank you for your son. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that uh, that first advent and how you came here and truly the Prince of Peace and the way you presented yourself to the scribes and the Pharisees and Pilate and all the things that happened, Lord, and the way you turned yourself over to die on that cross so that we might be saved. Thank you for fulfilling the purpose of which the Father sent you to, here to do. And we glorify you, Lord Jesus. We honor you. We love you. We want to celebrate your body and your blood today. But we don't want this to be about you. We want you to come into this room. We want to be talking to you like you're really here, because you are. So bless us, Lord, with your presence. And I, I pray the Holy Spirit to, to move on each person here today. I don't know where their hearts are. I don't know where their heads are at. But you do. Would you anoint them? Would you illuminate their, their minds and their hearts? To just understand your word. To be hopeful for the Christ and his soon return. And Lord, if there's anyone that's not, not connected to you, doesn't know you, I pray today would be a day of salvation. You would call them by name. For all of us that are going some hard stuff, really hard stuff. And we are concerned about our government. We're concerned about economies. We're concerned about China and Russia. We are. But help us to put that in the category, you are sovereign God. And you left us here to represent the gospel. So we trust you, Lord. We, we, you're the only one that can fix this. And I'm convinced only the gospel of Jesus Christ can bring us hope practically in Amarillo, Texas. Only the gospel can. So we pray for that, Lord, that it might be true. The sermon might be true to the gospel, to your word. And that you would receive all of the honor and all the glory. And all of God's people would say, See, when you talk about the triumphal entry, okay, it is a triumph. He's entering this Palm Sunday. He's being celebrated. I mean, the verse, this day, is being fulfilled. So it's not just a normal day. It's, it's a day that was predicted, a day that was fulfilled. And I want to share that with you. But it goes beyond the day. But I want you to feel, I want you to feel the way it felt for the multitude and the praises, which at that time, at that day, it was holy. Five days later, they were yelling out to crucify him. I want to know why that happened. But most of all, I want to see Jesus, what Jesus did for you and me. He knew what he was walking into. So look at Luke chapter 12, or excuse me, Luke chapter 19. Thank you, thank you. It's been an hour and a half since I just preached this. Okay, we're in... <laughs> Luke chapter 19, the triumphal entry. Uh, by the way, this is in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have the triumphal entry. So that's a really key story that the Holy Spirit, God the Father, wants you to pay attention to. It's over and over and over again. Uh, this is happening at Passover. So when this takes place, there's between two and three million people gathered there from around the world to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. This is the day that God has chosen centuries ago to reveal his son publicly, Amen. publicly. The triumphal entry, Jesus to Jerusalem as a suffering king. Verse 28. And when he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Hotwire the colt, hotwire it, <laughs> loose it and bring it here. <laughs> what? You want us just to steal a, a horse? You want to steal a donkey? You, you just go up and loose it. Do you know what in Amarillo, Texas, what they do with horse thieves? Hey, hey, Lord, what are you doing? He said, well, just loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Just say, that's, you shall say to him, well, because the Lord has need of it. Can I hear you say need of it? Need of it. This is a really weird story. It's not like Jesus is tired and needs a ride. 
He actually knows he's going to fulfill prophecy. But the, the disciples, they're still kind of going, okay, we're here. You told us you're going to die. Now we're going to prepare the Passover. He said, well, you need to go over such and such a place, go through the gate, and then you're going to find this donkey tie. Just loose it and bring it here. And if somebody says, what are you doing? We'll say, the Lord has need of it. So off they go, and it happens just the way he said. Well, why did Jesus say that? See, if you know the Bible, you know centuries before, to mark this day, Zechariah. Zechariah recorded in Zechariah 9, 9. Can I see the verse? Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold your king. Can I hear you say king? He's presenting himself as king of Israel. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just. Having salvation, lowly, riding on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Yes. Yeah, our king is going to come into our city triumphantly on a, on a donkey? I didn't do this in first service. He all. <laughs> No, if, if this is the king of Israel, the king of kings, well, where's the army? Where's the angels? Where's the trumpets? Where, where's, the, where's the soldiers? Where, I mean, this is the king. This is the triumphal entry. It is. But there's never been a king like King Jesus. He's not coming to conquer. He's coming to suffer. And to be a substitute for your sins. Now the multitudes don't know that. The disciples should know that. And the donkey. Now, when I see Zechariah, can I go back to Zechariah real quick? I just want to make sure you see this. Okay, that's in the Old Testament, right? It's okay for you to say right. And you say, I haven't, okay. Zechariah was a prophet, right? And so that's recorded, right? And if you were just reading Zechariah and you didn't get to the New Testament, you would say, I wonder what this means. I wonder what this could symbolize. I wonder how this would maybe apply to life. Hey, when you read the Bible, what, what that said actually is what happened. Right? Because now we're reading Luke. What Zechariah said is what happened. Oh, you mean when the Bible talks about stuff, what it says can actually happen? Duh. Ah, he was born of a virgin. What do you think that means? He was born in Bethlehem. We celebrate Christmas. Go find the donkey. Hotwire it. Bring it here. If they say anything, just say, the Lord has need of it. No, amen, they were obedient. You know, sometimes God asks you to do some really weird things. Like, talk to the disciples. Hey, Lord, they're all hungry. Find a sack lunch. <laughs> what? Hey, they're demanding we pay our taxes. Go fish. Pull out the coin. Hey, Lord, what do you need? Just go untie the donkey. If somebody asks. So they, they obey. Amen for verse 32. They obey. So we got prophecy fulfilled. Um, verse 32. So those who were sent went their way, and they found it just as Jesus had said to them. But as they were hot wiring the colt, the owner of it said to them, why are you loosening the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Can I hear you say, has need of him? Now, if you're a Bible scholar, If you're a theologian, a wannabe theologian, you would understand that's a very complicated little set of words. The Lord, Jesus, by the way, is the Lord. Amen. That means he's sovereign God. The Lord has need. Now wait, if you're sovereign God, you wouldn't have any needs. I mean, if you're sovereign God, just float in on a hoverboard. 
create a donkey. You know, come down from outer space. I mean, if you're sovereign God, what do you mean the Lord has need of your donkey? Think about that for a second. That, that the Lord, who could do anything he wants, has needs. We're not going to keep the donkey. We're going to borrow the donkey. Nobody sat on it. That's the one I want. Check it out in Zechariah. Really? Lord, do you borrow anything else? Well, you got a boat. I can borrow your boat. Great place to preach from. You mean you need? Yeah. You want to feed some people? Would you go out there and find the sack lunch? Hey, Lord, you're, you're Lord. You should just, poof. but see, he uses in his humanity, he's completely deity, but in his humanity, he has needs. He borrows stuff. Are you tracking with me? And you say, what's winning out here? Mm, the sovereignty of God always wins out, but he still has needs. And you say, where'd you get that from? Twice in that passage. Did you just learn something? You know what else he needs? I don't know if you can handle this. You know what else he needs? You. Are you saying that God needs me? Well, God doesn't need you. He wants to borrow you. He wants to use you. Uh, have you ever heard a sermon on that donkey? I haven't, so I'm just, no, I haven't. <laughs> but aren't you glad the donkey cooperated? <laughs> Woohoo! I don't know. If, I know donkeys can talk. That's another whole sermon. I got to go. I got to go. Okay. <laughs> so the Lord has a need of, of the donkey. So anyways, the Lord has need of him. Verse 35, then they brought him, the donkey, to Jesus. You have prophecy fulfilled. And they threw their, their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. What a privileged, privileged donkey. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Wow, something's happening here. So they got palm branches, they got clothes, they got the donkey. Here comes Jesus. Can I see the quote by Clark? This entry into Jerusalem has been termed the triumph of Christ. It was indeed the triumph of humility over pride and worldly grandeur, of poverty over affluence, and of meekness and gentleness over rage and malice. See, Jesus doesn't come in the way you would think. He comes in as a suffering king, a substitute for your sins and my sin. Very humble, very meek, very quiet. The people still expecting him to be a political Jesus, but the people begin to praise, and he wanted praise. This is, I mean, this is like his day. Verse 37, praise for the king. Then, then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, blessed is the king. Can I hear you say the king? That we, we saw a king already out of Zechariah, but here they're saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So they have this, this whole parade going on, this whole praise going on. And this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Psalms 118, 24 is actually coming true right before their eyes. And they're thankful. They're excited. They're praised. They're singing songs to Jesus because they think they're gonna, he's going to take care of everything. That's their motive. Can I see the quote by Guzik real quick? Jesus entered Jerusalem with a relative, relatively humble and motley escort and singing. The only symbols of his power were a humble donkey and palm branches. Upon entering the city, he did not offer sacrifices, but he challenged the religious status quo and he cleansed the temple. Now, you have to put yourself back. You got 
Two million people, three million people, they're, they're not all involved, but that section of the city and people start spontaneously praising, here comes Jesus. There, there's an amp to this. I mean, the reason why it's so amped up, because Jesus, as he was doing his miracles through the gospel, he saved his biggest miracle for last. I mean, right before this triumphal entry, he, he raised Lazarus from the dead. I mean, he was, he was dead, dead. By now he stinketh dead. Lazarus, come forth. And I'm telling you, when Lazarus walks out of that tomb, it went nuts. Social media blew up. I'm talking Facebook and all this stuff. Twitter, unbelievable. Even on TikTok, guess who just came out of the grave? And it was like a wildfire. Man, if, if Jesus can do that, man, he can smoke Rome. And get rid of this and get rid of that. And he could have. But there's a bigger problem. So the reason why all the people are praising him and stuff, I mean, you got this extra, extra illustration. Lazarus is very thankful for it, by the way. Uh, and so, it, and they're praising the Lord. They're praising the Lord. And, and that's good. Matter of fact, Jesus deserves that praise and that singing. Now, now, now picture if you were pilot looking at that, and I'm going to say sorry looking parade. It's the greatest parade in the history of mankind because it's Jesus coming to save us. But if you're pilot thinking, what's all the commotion? They're, they're singing a song. They don't have bazookas, they got palm branches. What, what are they doing? There's no soldiers. He's riding a donkey. It looks like the people who kind of believe in him, but. Probably people feel that way about you sometimes. Don't they know they're going to church in a grocery store? <laughs> They've lost their minds. They're trying to act like Jesus and. No big threat. They're just crazy. But not to Jesus. So picture all the people singing. Remember, the scribes and the Pharisees have already thrown it down. They're going to arrest him. The moment they, they can, they're going to they're get him. They've already got the plan in place. And now all these people are praising him like he's the king of kings. And so they, they just can't tolerate it. So they're going to try to rebuke them. Verse 39, some of the Pharisees, some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. So the, the guys that are going to kill him are ticked off at all the people praising him. So, hey, teacher, they don't call him king. Hey, teacher, rabbi, tell your disciples just to knock it off. I tell you, if they would quit singing and shouting praise, the rocks would cry out. Now, you think he's just giving an illustration? Oh, no. No, 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 no. My pastor Chuck, actually in his commentary, he says, I wish they would have stopped for a second so I could hear what the rocks would say. <laughs> you say, well, the rocks aren't going to say anything. Don't tell God. Don't tell God. Trees clap their hands. The universe got the sound going. I'm just saying, he's creator God. I do remember that old song that we used to sing. We haven't sung it in a long time. But, you know, ain't no rock going to take my place. Ain't no rock going to sing in my place. I'm going to sing and shout and amen to the Lord. I'm going to let a rock take my place. I can do that with my own mouth. That's just extra too. So there, there is the triumphal entry of suffering as Jesus comes in. But I, I told you, we're going to see where emotionally... Spiritually. Because I, I want to know what Jesus looked like on that donkey as he's coming. Everybody's praising him. That's true. The Pharisees are trying to rebuke. Instead, Jesus rebukes them. No, I mean, 
I'm going to let him cry out. But, but notice a weeping Jesus. Look at Luke carefully. We have Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. Now, as he drew near, he's still on the donkey. The people are still praising. As he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. Later, when you have a chance to go to Blue Letter Bible, take a lexicon, whatever you want to do, check out that word wept. It's not like he had a tear coming down his eye. He wailed. He wailed with sobbing over what's happening. I mean, his heart was broken. You need to know the emotions of Jesus when it comes to ones that reject him and then have to face the judgment. Right there, you have a picture of what it feels like to Jesus as he's coming in. He's sobbing, wailing. He burst into sobbing. All of those words. As he drew near, he saw the city. He wailed and burst into sobbing. He wept over it, saying, if you had known Jerusalem, if you had ever had known, even you, especially in this, this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come. Here's a prophecy. Here's a prediction. For the days will come when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close in on every side. They'll level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. You're like, acting like everything's fine and you don't know you're going to kill me in, in five days. I'm giving you a chance to know me as Savior. And you'd rather have some political Jesus that, that is, wasn't, doesn't exist. And you don't know what that means for you, Jerusalem. Jerusalem said this to the Christ. They said, no. You know what that means? When you say no to Jesus as a city or as a person, that means you've just given up all hope about your eternity. And what happens to the ones that say no? Judgment. We don't like to talk about that, but you know what? That's a big part of the Bible. You say no to Jesus, guess what happened? His very city, Jerusalem, said no. And Jesus wailing. Notice the heart of God. It does not bring any delight to God to judge anybody. It does not. That's why he sent his son. He loves you. But you say no to the love of God, to Jesus. What do you got? You got nothing. You got nothing. So Jesus wailing and weeping over Jerusalem because he can see the future. You're going to put me on a cross. I'm going to conquer that. I'm going back to heaven. Then you're going to carry on your merry way for about 30 years. And then Nero's going to come out of Rome and wipe you out. There's going to be an embankment around you. Not one stone will be left upon another when he's done. Jesus knew all of that. And it broke his heart. Don't break his heart. Because he was right on all of that. If you go with me to Israel, you'll still see those stones. Not one was left upon another. It all came down. Nero wiped it out. Gone for like 2,000 years. Back because God's got another plan. He hasn't finished yet. Amen? You see, they missed the day of their visitation. Well, I thought you'd be this. No, I'm this. I thought you would do that. I came to do this. He's the prince of peace that laid down his life so that you might have peace with God. With God. And yourself. Hmm. So that was the day. They should have known the day. That was the day. Can I see Guzik real quick? Jesus here showed the heart of God. The heart of God. How even when judgment must be pronounced, it is never, ever, ever done with joy. Even when God's judgment is perfectly just and righteous, his heart weeps at the bringing of the judgment. Can I hear an amen? Amen. You know, a lot of people that criticize God, they don't know his heart. They don't know his heart. I gave you my son. It broke my heart. I gave you my son. And if judgment comes, that breaks my heart too. That's God.
And this day, matter of fact, all the theologians should have known that this is the day. This is the day. This is the day the Lord has made. Well, rejoice and be glad. Not, not a day, not a season, this day. Because way back in Daniel, can I see Chuck Smith real quick? Real quick. The, the day had finally arrived. The day that had been foretold by Daniel in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Exactly. 173,880 days after the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. This was the day. Talked about in Psalms 118.24. It was time. So anybody that would have known their Bible and they calculated, they could have figured out, this is the day. Look for him. He's going to come right down plains. He's, he's going to be right there because this is the day. That's why you have a Bible. Okay. That was extra. You say, so what's the point? The triumphal entry, he came as the suffering king. But that's not the end of the story. Is not? Well, it was the end for him in the first advent. He was resurrected. 40 days later, he ascended back to heaven. And here we are. What happens next? Well, he comes back. There's another triumphal entry that's still in our future. We missed the first one. I don't want to miss the second one. You say, where'd you get that from? Oh, Zachariah. Zach's a really good friend of mine. Because you know what? He's a prophet. What he says actually comes true. Look at Zechariah 14. I mean, turn in your Bibles this time back to Zechariah chapter 14. That's on page 1171. The first time he came as a king was suffering in his triumphal entry. This time he comes to the Mount of Olives as a conquering king. A conquering king. He came as a humble servant the first time. The second time he's coming, like, get out of my way. We're going to take care of business. What? What? It's in the Bible. I'm not making it up. Look at Zechariah 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. Hey, for this day to happen, you have to have a Jerusalem. Duh, duh. You have to have an Israel. Duh. You have to have everybody in the world mad at her. Duh. Are you with me? You could be whatever age. You should at least know there's an Israel back after 2,000 years, and everybody wants to wipe her out. That's perfect. Zechariah chapter 9 literally happened. I believe Zechariah 14 will literally happen. What? All the nations are going to come against Israel. And guess what? They ain't going to win. We call it the Battle of Armageddon. But Zach calls it, look at verse 3. Then the Lord will go... Uh, forth and fight against those nations. Well, no, I thought he came as a peacemaker until the second advent. This is the second advent. He's going to go fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. That's very specific. Just like the donkey in chapter 9. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain will move to the north, the other half toward the south. My favorite place to preach in the entire world is the Mount of Olives. I'd love to be preaching there next February and the rapture to happen. I think that'd be sweet. You say, why the Mount of Olives? Because when you're on the Mount of Olives, you can see Jerusalem, you can see Calvary, you can see the Temple Mount. I mean, you're in the sweetest spot there is. Plus, that's where he ascended back to heaven, and that's where he will come back, and his feet will touch down. You say, where'd you get that? Zechariah. Zechariah says that, right? And then, well, how do you know that didn't happen already? Because the mountain ain't split. I've been there like nine times. They ain't split, you know, because when he comes back and his feet touch down, first advent, Bethlehem, touchdown on planet Earth. Second advent, touchdown, Mount of Olives. First advent, suffering, savior, king. Second advent, conquering king. You mean like Braveheart, William Wallace stuff? Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> so, for all you guys, and you say, well, Zechariah. Oh, no, no, no. I read the back of the book. Look at Revelation 19. Real quick. Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 11. You say, well, Revelation just kind of gives us an idea of what might happen with somebody's dream. Revelation tells us what's going to happen. Like Zechariah told us what's going to happen. Revelation 19, 11. I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse. He who sat on him is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and he makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. 
He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, I believe we're a part of that. I really do. The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Can I hear an amen? amen? If you ride a motorcycle and you like to be a biker, amen. If you're a cowboy and you like to ride horses, amen. Who better to ride with than Jesus? Where are we going? He's, we're going to go take care of business now. Serious? Serious. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. With it, he, would stri he should strike the nation. Their time is limited. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Yes, Lord Jesus. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. That's my suffering Savior, Jesus, and my conquering King, Jesus. So you got it? I mean, do you have it? Triumphal entry number one, suffering savior. Triumphal entry number two, conquering king. Amen. But that's not the most important. It's not the most important. You see, the most important triumphal entry is when he invades your heart. Amen. Can I see Ezekiel? I will give you a new heart. Put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Amen. What? There's a new covenant coming. We're going to celebrate it today in this table. I'll give you a new heart. I want a new heart. I'll put a new spirit. I want a new spirit within you. I will take that heart of stone you have, Bill. You have a heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of of flesh. What are you saying, Lord? This is your heart, Bill. It's rock solid hard. Well, maybe I can fix it. Maybe I can go to church. Maybe I can memorize the Ten Commandments. Maybe I can try to be a tither. Maybe I can fast with a crazy church. It's up to something. Problem is, you still have a hard heart. I was careful not to drop it on my toes. <laughs> you say, well, maybe we can get therapy. It ain't gonna help your hard heart. Maybe I can learn to live at peace with my neighbor. No, well, maybe you can, but it doesn't solve your heart problem. You have a hard stone heart. What do I need? You need Jesus to give you a new heart. Now, I wanted to get like a cow's heart or something, but I thought, no, that's too much. It's actually too much. So I chose clay instead of a... Oh, Lord, what are you going to do? Well, when you say yes to me, I'm going to take that rock out of your chest and give you a new heart. Now, I was a blockhead beside a hard-hearted guy before I realized... What do you want to do? I, I want to come in. I want to be your savior. I want to do a triumphal entry in your heart. Well, what are you going to do when you do that? I'll give you a new heart. Well, how do I get a new heart? You say yes to Jesus. And then right away, I mean, the Holy Spirit and the Lord, he puts a new spirit, a new heart in you. And, and you, get this, you get this heart like, like God's heart somehow. And, and you'll know when that happens because you'll know. You'll remember when your heart was a heart of stone. You're just a stubborn blockhead. I'm not making fun of you. I was that guy. I was that guy. And finally, when I said yes to Jesus, I didn't know. I just didn't want to go to hell. But I didn't know. I didn't know you'd give me a new heart. I didn't know I'd get a heart of flesh. I didn't know the Holy Spirit. I didn't know that you would come in gently, humbly, graciously, peacefully. I didn't know that the first thing I would have was peace with God. What a thing to have peace with God. And the peacemaker himself, Jesus Christ. You see, the... the the biggest triumphal entry is into your heart. Amen. But then he doesn't tell you right up front. Yeah, I'm going to come into your heart as a gentle savior, humbly and meekly. We'll just mold it around. 
but, but I'm also going to come as conquering king into your heart. Well, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. I gave you my heart. No, you gave me, and now I gave you a new one. Now what I'm going to do with the word of God, with the sword that comes out of my mouth, I'm, I'm going to actually shape your heart because your heart isn't exactly like mine yet. You have a new heart. And so that's really good. You're saved. Go to heaven with your new heart. But you see, I'm not, I, I need to use you in a, in a world going crazy. So I'm actually going to come in and I'm going to poke around in your heart. No, that's my heart. No, you gave it to me. And I gave you a new heart. Well, now wait, Lord, there's a, I, I know what you're holding back on me. It's like you gave me 75% of your heart. I want 100% of your heart. Well, how are you going to get it? With my word, my word, my word. I'm going to come in. I'm going to conquer it. I am. You can either make this easy or hard for you. It's called sanctification. Well, do I have a choice? Yeah, do you want it to be easy or hard? <laughs> my counsel to you is let it be easy. Well, what does that mean? Just take your heart that he gave you anyways and say, Lord, this is your heart. You gave it to me. And with his Holy Spirit, he, he's able to, to go deeper into that heart as a conquering king, a conquering king. Because he knows where you're holding out. He doesn't do it to be mean. He does it so that you'll be more effective representing him in a world going crazy. Have you noticed our world's going crazy? And we all want to fight. I, I get that. I get that. But Jesus says, let me do this. Let me do things that you, you'll end up looking like me. You'll end up singing songs and crying like me. You'll end up being a faithful witness. Like me. The greatest triumphal entry is the suffering Jesus and the conquering Jesus that comes into your heart. Not only problem solved about going to heaven, problem solved about how to get through Monday. Monday. Can I see the verse out of Timothy? Now to the king, that's the Lord Jesus. To Jesus, the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you include stories like the triumphal entry in four different gospels and millions of people that had an opportunity to see and respond to Jesus. Thank you that you preserved it for us, that we could do a little bit of study and catch the vibe of what really was going on that day, not just with people, but in the Son, your Son's heart. Thank you that you grieve over sin. Thank you that you weep over rejection and judgment. And that, Lord, you gave your life so that we could have a new heart. You gave your body and your blood, your heart was broken so that we could have a new spirit. That you'll take this heart of stone inside of us, Lord, and turn it into a heart of flesh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your conquering, your sanctification. And how you go deeper and deeper into this new heart. I know many times I hold back parts of my life, parts of that heart that you want to do a deeper work. So we just, we just come to you at your table and pray for a new heart, a new spirit, new purpose, new life, all made possible by the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God himself could be you're here today you know you have a heart of stone you know it's rock hard you know it and you hear different sermons at different times you might even come to this church at different times but you still have a heart of stone you've learned how to paint it or dress it up or act right when you're in church but 
The bottom line is you have a cold, stubborn, hard rock of a heart. And Jesus wants to give you a new one. And he has a way of gently knocking on the door of your life and coming as the Prince of Peace invites you once again to say yes to him. Or it could be you're here today and you know you're saved, but it's kind of like your heart's got hard. It's not pumping the way it used to or the way it should be. And you're so agitated at so many things. And God wants to do a deeper work, a conquering within your heart. It's like you need bypass surgery or something or a pacemaker or something. It's just, I'm just speaking spiritually that you just need Jesus to come and be that conqueror and sanctifier with your heart. It's the same Jesus who wants to set us free and for us to be used by him. So before we partake of his table, you might be here this morning and you know that you just need him as your savior. You need him as your savior, your heart's heart. You know it. And you want that new heart. Or you might be here and you need a fresh connection because you know your heart's getting hard again. I'm just going to invite you, if there's anybody here second service, if that's you, to make a public confession of that. I'm just going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to call you up front or anything, but just to stand so we can pray with you before we partake of communion. Is there anybody here that says, I need a new heart? I just, it's what I need. Thank you, sister. Thank you, brother. And thank you, sister. Thank you, guys. Thank you, sister. Thank you, sister. Father, you see the ones standing. You see some that are holding up their hands. More importantly, you see everybody in their seats crying out, that's what I need. Everybody on YouTube, everybody on radio, you know. Thank you, Lord, that under the new covenant, thank you with the sacrifice of your son, we freely get a new heart, all by grace, all by mercy, all by the goodness of God. When we just turn from our sins and trust you and receive that gift of the Lord Jesus. We believe, Lord, we believe. I pray for the ones that find stubbornness and hardness kind of creeping back in. Just a fresh dose of your spirit. Take our hearts again, Lord, and make them like yours, we pray. As we come to your table, I ask, Lord, that the body of Christ and the blood of our Savior would do its fresh work in all of us, and that we would rejoice going through this week in anticipation of Resurrection Sunday. For the glory of Jesus and all of God's people would say, you guys want to thank the ones that are standing? Or... We're going to celebrate his table. Please hold on to the elements till everyone's been served. Would you guys stand with me? For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. We had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup and after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant, the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, thank you for your son. Lord Jesus, thank you for the new covenant. Thank you for the gospel. We thank you for your body, a God, man, body that could die in our place. We do, Lord, remember. And your blood, that you bled out for us, Lord, so that we could be saved. 
as we partake of your table. Bless your people, Lord, I pray. All the glory and honor to Jesus. It's in his name we'd ask. Amen. Enjoy your Lord. <laughs>